internet. I think this is where we clap. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Chase Jarvis Live. I'm Chase Jarvis, your host, your guide. And wow, what a show do we have here today. Uh, once or twice a month, I like to get together on this stage or up in Seattle with people who inspire the hell out of me, who drive me crazy in the best way. Uh, and, and today's guest is, I mean, Mind blower, I feel so lucky to call her my friend and to have her on the stage. Before that, uh, we've had a little contest going for the last week of the people who've been promoting the show. I want to say thank you very much for pimping the show. And we have given away two gift certificates, gift certificates to one of our sponsors, Creative Live, for, gosh, 200 bucks, I think, for pimping the show. So thank you very much. And the winners of those are at Dave Prothero and at Robin McIntyre. So email production at... What are we, emailing production at Chase Jarvis or something like that? Try that. Email production at Chase Jarvis, and we'll make sure to get you a couple hundred bucks. And thanks again for pimping the show. Huge shout out to Creative Live for making this possible. Borrow lenses is where I get my gear. But today's show is going to rock your world. The person that we are talking to, um, she calls herself a vulnerability expert, a researcher, a storyteller. I know her as a TED Talk maniac badass, uh, someone who's deeply, deeply inspired me. I call her a life changer, a game changer. Um, and she also has three New York Times bestsellers in the top 10 right now. One of, that's crazy. <laughs> I know. It's, I don't think that's ever happened, actually. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, her new book, about how it affects creativity and uh, a lot of the things that are near and dear to us. So. Please, if you'd like to participate in the conversation, hashtag CJ Live, ask questions. If you're anywhere in the world, you can communicate with this room right here. And although we've got 50 people here, you can participate in the conversation. Big round of applause for Brene Brown. Woo! Hi. I'm so happy. Ooh. How are you? Please. I hope, I hope water's good. Oh, we didn't water's really great. ask you what you wanted. Yeah, okay. no, it's perfect. Awesome. Hi. Woo. Hello. It's been a while. And how long has it been? I think it's like a year and change, maybe. So maybe someone can find out the answer to that and get back to us. It feels like a year, but a year of living with your material has been a very, very powerful year for me personally. Because Daring Greatly was a game changer for me. And you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to open with is only after you've sort of read all the bits of work that you've done, the books, of which, again, you have three is that like is that real? Three books in the top ten in the New York Times bestseller list? Is that I don't has know. that ever I, happened before? I was upstairs and my husband started screaming, "Hat trick! Hat trick!" <laughs> I was like, "What's happening? What does that mean?" <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it was crazy. It was really exciting. Oh, it's so powerful. And I've got an amazing community. Um, yeah, for real. I do. Like they're, they they um, rock. They move mountains. Um, I feel I consider myself a part of your community. So likewise. We move mountains, right? We move mountains. Um, yeah. So the work really, really made sense to me with this. Not that it didn't make sense before, but it was galvanized. Like, oh my gosh, she's systematically knocking down these dominoes. Um, you know, basically the first book is like, um, be vulnerable. Second one is put yourself out there. Third one is when you're down, here's how to get up. But you have a much more eloquent way of talking about it. I've heard some of your interviews before. So tell us, talk about the trilogy and talk about Rising Strong, what we're talking about today. OK. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back. Awesome. Everything you're doing you're, is really exciting. You are always welcome anytime right there. I walked in and I was like, oh my gosh. We're growing up a little bit, huh? Yeah. Like, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. It's a big deal. Thank you And I know a lot much. of people that you're really changing their lives. I, I, Create a life, so congratulations. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Just can't get back to you. I'm getting awkward. It's getting awkward. Here. <laughs> Let's talk about you for a no. <laughs> you imagine? Well, vulnerability, me on stage, that's not a bad thing. We'll a talk about it. Mental and, health uh, professional, I could really mess with him, right? Uh, <laughs> Wouldn't that be for fun sure. to watch for just a little while? Um, but we'll talk about me when it gets to the gold plated grit part of this oh, conversation. Yeah, yeah. me too. Okay, but back to you, please. Okay, so I guess the way I think about it, and I don't think it meant to be a trilogy, it was just kind of the organic growing of the research. So I think of the gifts of imperfection as be you, yep. and then daring greatly as be all in, and then rising strong is get your ass kicked, learn something, get up, and go back in. Um, and so it made sense, and there almost felt like an ethical imperative after daring greatly, because we just would get thousands of emails that are like, I dared greatly and she left me, or I dared greatly, and I got fired, or, you know, and so I thought, yeah, because the only thing I know for sure about being courageous with your life, and you know this as 
everyone knows this, is if you're brave enough often enough, you're gonna fall. And sure. it's so funny because you know, I spend the majority of my time now with leaders. And I'll say, you know, if you're brave enough often enough, you're gonna fall. And they're like, I'm willing to risk falling. I'm like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're going to risk falling. Yeah. I'm saying you're actually guaranteed. You're you guaranteed <laughs> you're gonna fall. It, you're gonna get hurt. Um, and they're like, well, I believe if we mitigate the risk, I'm like, no, mm -mm. you can mitigate the risk all the way to the point where you're not being brave anymore. Yeah. Right. Oh, so painful to hear, but so right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I live it. I know. Um, you know, I've I got a lot of face plant experience um, personally and professionally, so I think this seemed like the right next thing to do. And the, the beauty of it is we need recipes. We're humans. I think life is a big, ambiguous thing, especially for uh, the, the, a large part of the audience in this room and, and uh, that pay attention to what I do in Creative Live are creatives. And there's a, I think it's fair to say that there's sort of an emotional sensibility that people who are creative for a living or classify themselves as such, that there's sort of a, a vulnerability or sensitivity, I feel like just knowing myself and my yeah. peers, and we haven't really ever been given the toolkit to get back up. And so this book, I'm gonna actually maybe get a nice blank. <laughs> right, right. Um, it's, it's just been a tremendous toolkit that I'll go back to over and over again. And I would love to, in your own words, mm -hmm. talk about the, the, what you've done and there's this great line, is you're in the arena. Actually, do you, do you know the, the quote by heart, the arena I quote? Do. So this was a big part of Darren Greatly, and we talked about it in the last time you were on the show. Can you just give us that quote? Because yeah. it's awesome. It was, it's the total arc of it. Um, came across this quote in a very diff after the TED Talk went viral. Which um, is awesome. Yeah, and I was in every, like, every online outlet you can imagine from the BBC to Al Jazeera to, you know, like what is this, who, what is this TED talk and why vulnerability? And there were just, I made the mistake of reading all the online comments. Um, and <laughs> against my, the advice of my therapist and my husband. Um, and in those comments was every single thing I feared and everything that kind of kept me keeping my career kind of small and safe. And so I came across this quote that day and it, it was Theodore Roosevelt, it's not the critic who counts. Um, and it just says, it's not the critic who counts, it's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done it better. The credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again and again, and who in the end may know the triumph of high achievement, and who when he fails, at least does so daring greatly. And Jules. Yeah, I mean, and so in that moment, um, I just knew that I wanna live my life in the arena, that's who I wanna be, I wanna be brave with my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a huge game changer for me too. The being in the arena, it used to have one connotation because the, it was reserved for, for the people who were selling out Madison Square Gardens right. and were on television professionally and in the news. Right. And now we're all creators. We're all, totally. uh, you know, we're, we, we no longer require permission from yeah. anyone to be putting our stuff out there. We used to require permission from the gallerist or the newspaper or, or uh, the person who manages Madison Square Garden. But right. we... we we no longer have that. So again, I go back to toolkit. Now that there are so many more of us and it's so so easy to actually be in the arena, we, we need this toolkit. So thank you for writing it, first of all. Well, and let me go back and say thank you to you and all the creatives, because I spent a huge portion, for the first time really in my career, a huge amount of time interviewing specifically creatives for this work. Because what's interesting is you have the toolkit. Tell us about us. Yes. Yeah, no, I, yeah. You, do you want to learn about you? Um, <laughs> you have the tools. I mean, th here's what. Here's the biggest compliment to me. If I give a talk or someone watches my TED Talk, I get usually what people will say is, I already knew everything you said. I just had no language for it. I had no way to think about it and hold it. Um, creatives have the tools because what I wanted to do going into this research is I asked myself, who rises strong? Who gets their asses kicked on a regular basis and gets they get back up with more tenacity and courage just in the course of a day? That was my question. So the very first answer I had, creatives. Um, and it was a weird mix. It's creatives, special forces, veterans, 
um, people who just, you have to rise because it's part of your job. And so the thing that I, you know, when you're a creative, every day you wake up, you walk into the dark. Every day you, you do this with your life and your work and you show us something that you've made and something that you've done and something that's important to you. Um, and it never goes well every time. But it's your job to either dismiss the feedback that's just hurtful and not gonna be helpful or bring in the feedback that's helpful and to get back up. You have to get back up for a living. Every day. Every day. And so to me, what was the craziest thing about creativity and talking to makers. And you know, and for me, a creative is, I don't care whether you're rebuilding an engine sure. or you're a photographer. That is so true. You Creativity know? with a capital C is, I mean, the wheel is mechanical engineering plus creativity. Right. You know, E equals MC squared is theoretical science plus creativity. Right. So creativity with a capital C is literally the solution to every fundamental human problem. So Ever. it's not just painters, photographers, right. musicians, yeah. And, and I think we talked about this last time, you know, there's no such thing as creative and not creative beings. So true. Right. Um, and in fact, the big joke, I, I used to be like very anti-creative. Um, and people would say, hey, do you want to go do this? And I'm like, oh, that's cute. No. Um, you go do your, you go, you do Good your draw. little A-R-T. I've got a J-O-B. And you can circle back when you want to do some real stuff. And then I get into this research and it's like. She said that way too many times. I'm just like. No, yeah, I do. I just said it. Um, and then I get into this research and I'm like, oh, my God. We're all creative. And the worst part was unused. It was so clear in the data. Unused creativity. Creativity that's been disowned is not benign. It's powerful and it's painful. It's painful. It metastasizes and turns into dangerous things. And so talking to creatives, you ha all have the tools. You just do it every day. So what I wanted to do is just pluck them out, pull them apart, look at them, and name them. What is the process men and women who fall and get back up and are braver having fallen in the service of courage? What do they have in common? And it's a three-step process, right? I mean, it is kind of a three-step process. I always hate to call it that because it makes it sound like it might be easy. It's not a three-step yeah, process. Yeah, it's not a three-step <laughs> process. It's not easy. It's, there are things that people have in common okay. across the data. And so the first Do is, tell. yeah. yeah. Men and, so let me back, let me, let's tell a story. Okay. Okay. Mm, I love, you're a professional. I love stereotypes. Yes, a story. Okay, so. Chase and I leave this interview, and we walk out, and I'm talking to Kate, and I'm like, thanks so much for having me, Chase, and he goes, <sighs> and I'm like, so I get in my car, and I'm going back to my hotel, and I'm like, oh my God, what did that, I sucked, I must have screwed it up, I must have said something wrong, what did I, I never liked Chase, you know what, I don't even know why I did this, like all of a sudden, <laughs> I, yes, yes or no, yes or I no, right? I can't hear those words for pretend, it yeah, hurts. Yeah, no, <laughs> why? Because when something hard happens, we are neurobiologically wired for one thing, and that's survival. So when something hard happens, when you show someone a piece of your work, or something, or you get a dirty look, or someone makes a comment, the first thing our brain does is scramble to make sense of it. And the brain recognizes the narrative structure of a story, beginning, middle, and end. So the brain wants a story that says, here's what's happening, but the story has no, can have no uncertainty or ambiguity. Chase is maybe being a jerk. He doesn't like you. He didn't think you were very I don't smart like on the this show. Story. I know it's a bad. <laughs> oh, let me tell you a real story. Wait, y'all want to know a real story? Yeah, I don't like the painful part of the yeah, big no. story. Yeah, no. Let me tell you this. <laughs> let me tell you this real story. This just happened. I spoke at HubSpot last week. Okay, thirteen thousand people in this Boston Convention Center. It's like ten minutes before I go on, and I'm making. The, I look at Twitter, and I'm this person sends this tweet out that says. Why is Brene at HubSpot? Why is at Brene Brown at HubSpot 2015? And he had just tweeted like, love Seth Godin, love Amy Schumer, all these people, but why is Brene Brown? And I'm like, oh my God, why am I at HubSpot? What am I doing here? Um, and then I'm like, I start sweating and it's like, and you know, it's a convention center. It's like, you know, ladies, you know, I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? And I'm, I'm the opening keynote and I'm like, and then he tweets it again. And I'm like, oh my God. And so I'm like, these are marketing people. I don't know anything. So I start Googling on my phone, um, marketing terms 2015. And <laughs> wait, the first term that comes up is incentivize. I'm like, I've got to work the, I've got to work the word incentivize into this, this keynote. I'm like, what does that mean exactly? I don't know. But I'm going to say, we're going to incentivize. You know, I'm like, what is happening? And I have a total crisis of confidence. Like, because, you know, shame drives two tapes. Not good enough and who do you think you are? And I'm like, who, who am I? 
right, snaps, terrible. Um, and so then all of a sudden, I'm like, who is it? Because what happens when you get backed into a corner? My brain is making up the story. You don't belong here. I'm like, that story's not gonna work because I'm going on in five seconds. <laughs> I'm like, so I'm like, okay, the best case scenario, attack, attack, attack this guy. Maybe attack him from the stage. Maybe use that as my opening. You maybe say like, John Doe, ask what I'm doing here. Well, let me tell y'all, you know, and then I, click on the tweet to figure out what his name is, and I accidentally hit the link in his tweet, and it goes to this page that says, what is Brene Brown doing at HubSpot? She's talking about vulnerability, and that's so important. Here's her TED Talk, <laughs> here are her books. Um, could you imagine if I would've gone out there and been like a great, dear jerk. Yeah, <laughs> totally. No, and that's a true story. It just happened because- oh, so this is, can we go back to me? Now, it was, I, I, I was, you were just telling a story, a fake story about me, and it wasn't really that you were mad at me. No. Okay, good. Phew. No, okay. but we need to understand story. We need to understand- There's the, a story and you're missing pieces? Is, okay. Yes, because so what happens is when something hard happens and we're captured by something difficult, our emotions get the first crack at making sense of something, a, a bad look, a hard phone call, a, a disagreement at work. We think that we're rational beings. We think that cognition is going to carry us through and make sense of it, but it doesn't, you know, emotions driving, thought and behavior are not even in the front seat riding shotgun. They're not even in the back seat. Thought and behavior in the trunk going, hey, and emotions driving. So the first thing we do is we tell ourselves a story that reduces ambiguity about what happened. So, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not good enough to be here. Oh, in my fake story about you, yes. I did something that pissed him off. I said something wrong. I didn't do something right. Men and women who have the greatest capacity for rising strong, in the moment something happens, they hack into that neurobiological process of making up a story. They stop and say, wait a minute, what's actually going on here? What is, what am I feeling? What do I know for sure? Because what is, you know, what is a story? There's a name in research for a story that has one or two limited data points and we fill in the rest with fear. Wow. It's called a conspiracy. <laughs> a conspiracy is a story with limited data points. So here's what I know. I know a guy's in a tweet. I know I'm getting ready to talk. That's all I know. So now that I'm ready to ruin his career, and use him as a whipping person, you know, as I talk. What is going on? Why? Because I'm making up a story to minimize. How many of you have ever gotten in a conflict at work and you walk out of the conflict with a whole story made up about what's happening? Uh, put your hands up, yo. Yeah, <laughs> not, not rhetorical, yo, yeah, right. Or your partner says something, like Steve the other day was like, no, I don't think, I, I'm like, I have nothing to wear to your party tonight. I, don't, I mean, I just, I'm so stressed out. I just got him on this book tour. And he's like, maybe we'll stay home. I'm like, do you think I'm not gonna look cute at the party? <laughs> like, are you worried that I'm not gonna be rocking out at the party? I'll look good at the party if we get a party. He's like, no, I, I'm just trying to be helpful. Like, do you not wanna go, no. Look, if you wanna go by the party, but you wanna take somebody else to the party? He's like, okay, what's Whoa. happening? Whoa. Right, how many of you have ever been in that? This poor guy's looking like, is that, is, is that what's happening? <laughs> Is that, Yesterday. yes, right. So how do we, in the moment of hard things happening, a fall, and a fall can be anything, and let me tell you for sure, a fall can be heartbreak, a fall can be failure at work, a fall can be a, sli a disappointment, but the minute something happens, emotion gets the first crack at it. And so we have to stop in that moment, and instead of conspiring, or confabulating, which is one of my favorite words from the book. Oh, what what is a, isn't it a great word? What's a confabulation? A confabulation is a lie told honestly. And so as a social worker, we study confabulation when we talk about um, traumatic brain injury or we talk about dementia. So a confabulation would be, Steve's like, why don't we just stay home tonight? I know you're exhausted, you just flew in. And I'm like, you know what, dude, whatever. And then I go into my room, I call Kate and I'm like, you ain't gonna believe. Steve doesn't want to take me to the party because he thinks I look bad in my dress. Is that a lie? Yeah. Or is it a confab? Is it a lie told honestly? It's what I believe. I know that's painful. <laughs> right. But it is like. But it's a lie, right? It's yeah, not. It's an do you see how lie. it gets crazy? It get, what if and I you were, go there for you go there at uh, 100 miles an hour? 100 it's, miles it's an like hour. Transported there instantly. Right. Okay. So that's the trick. You're 100 miles an hour. So here was what I almost did at HubSpot. I almost looked up at the person coordinating the event, 
and almost sad before I went on stage. You know, really and truly, if you're going to have me at these events or you're going to have speakers at this event, you should really make sure that people who work for you around the country are not being hurtful. You're like, could you imagine if I would have, like... Oh. <laughs> and you're this close from doing that, it, right? I'm that close. I got the whole speech. Because who are you when you get hurt? Like, if something... Let's talk about you, Chase. Oh, no, I was afraid this was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. okay so something, something hard happens. Yeah. Um, someone makes a really, a really hard criticism of something you're doing with your work. Sure. What is the first thing that you do? What is your go-to response when something hard happens? Is to decide if that's valid. And I, I read the thing and I'm like, and I generally, I've, I've trained myself to not, but I, 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 it's a response to my human, the cellular level says, I'm gonna apply that filter to reality, and, or apply that statement using my filter to reality, and my default is that this person probably knows something I don't know. And so I actually, my human response is to read it and to take it personally. And I have trained myself through reading YouTube comments. You guys done that lately? It's not pleasant. <laughs> that's, um, not, that's not smart. Yeah, that's not smart. Yeah. But uh, I have trained myself. My response now is I go back to the arena. I go back to my little list. You, yeah. She told me to make a little list, yes. which is here are the people who give a shit or that you yes. give a shit about. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's so good. She's got it in her bag. So, and, and I'm like, okay, this person's not on the list of people that I, I love. And I've done this professionally for a long time. If you do any great work, you're gonna have, you're gonna create naysayers. But the the part that I'm sad at, and the, the part that I'm sharing here, is that it does kick off a little. There's a little conversation that happens, even if I'm at the end, like, okay, cool, you're still you. you, you got this. But I hate that I burn the cycles thinking about it. Okay, so take, let's do... This is, this is therapy here, folks. No, this is really, this is really helpful, because I can tell you, I can tell you right now, when something emotional happens to me, you know, some of us, some of us want to hide, and some of us come out swinging, and some of us come out people-pleasing. I must, I come out swinging. Got it. Like, I, I would say, so, what, I, so in if, that, if, in I was given moment, those, if I was given yeah. A, B, or C, it would be, like, processing, um, and, no, I'm, I'm still good, I got this, but... Let me show you, for okay. sure. So I'm a swinger. Okay. And it's like, I don't even know you, fool. Like, pfft. Yeah. So, and then I would try and um, compensate by doing something more awesome. But, right, improving even more. Of so, course. the thing. Which is that, a terrible thing. It is a terrible yeah. thing because it's exhausting because then you're like, what am I, like, what am I doing? You know, now I'm on the stage making fun of somebody, putting them down. I'm probably getting them fired. Um, and for what? Because, because what? Because of a tweet. And a tweet that was actually incredibly complimentary yeah. in your work. Yeah, and that, you know, yeah. So that thing that you do, and I know you mm -hmm. do this, because we've talked about it before, mm -hmm. the thing where you pause and you ask hard questions yep. is exactly what men and women do who rise strong. All right. I'll yeah, no, it. yeah, no, you, they do. In those moments, they reckon with emotion. So the first step of the, the first step of rising strong is recognize you've been snagged by emotion and get curious about it. That's it. But how many of you were raised in families where you were encouraged to get curious about your emotions and talk about them and explore them, <laughs> right? Sure. Versus how many of you were raised in families where you were taught, hey, suck it up, yep. push through and get it done. So the first thing is really reckoning with emotion. What am I feeling and, and what do I need to know more about? That is a huge, and so that thing that you say, like, yeah. does, this some, does someone know something that I don't know? Do they have information I don't have? That's a huge part of the reckoning. We just don't do it. So in that minute, in the backstage, when I was you know, on my phone, I could have just said, whoa, Brene, you're like, heart is racing, your, your teeth are clenched, and you're going in for the kill here. What do you know about this? Yeah. Nothing. You know nothing. And what if you knew everything? Who cares? Who gives a shit? Yeah. You know, there are 13,000 people. You're going to spend an hour targeting one guy you don't know? And 12,999 are going to walk out of there with their mouth wide open, like, what just happened to me? That was incredible. But have you ever watched it? Have you ever watched someone take down someone yeah. because they were hurt? Yeah. Oh. What does that feel like? It's, it's gross. It's so painful. Yeah. It's so painful. Look, I'm getting sweaty just talking about HubSpot. <laughs> I'm like, really? Let me tell you when, you, when you're getting ready to go on and you look at your phone and it says, oh. why is she here? Oh. You're like... <laughs> So the first part is to reckon, but what do most of us do with emotion? Instead of reckoning, most of us offload emotion. We push it down, we numb it, we rage. 
Um, we are much better at inflicting pain than feeling pain. Much better at causing hurt than handling hurt. So the first thing is we have to really reckon with emotion. We asked hundreds and hundreds of people, and we don't know a lot about emotion. We asked hundreds and hundreds of people, list every emotion you've ever felt or that, you're, that you know about, that you understand. Do you know what the average number was? Less than 10 has to be. Guess. Three, four. Five. Three. Three? Did you study before you came here? <laughs> no. The average person acknowledges that they're familiar with or know or can recognize three emotions or affects in themselves. Happy, sad, and pissed off. Wow. So how can we reckon with emotion and recognize it if we don't even know what emotion is? We weren't raised with an emotional lexicon. You know, we weren't raised to understand, wow, something is going on. So true. Right? Yeah. So we're t we're to, to take it back to 30,000 feet just for a second, if you're just joining us from somewhere out in the world, I'm Chase Jarvis. I'm sitting here with Brene Brown, and we're talking about her new book, Rising Strong. We're taking questions in just a couple minutes at hashtag CJ Live on the Facebooks and the Twitters. You folks in the in-studio audience, if you, I know there's a lot of people taking notes and writing questions. Y'all are note we'll takers. Get, yeah, we, yeah we, we'll, we'll get to you in just a second. Uh, but to frame the conversation again, right now, you're talking about sort of one of the steps towards proce yeah. the, the process of rising strong, right? right? So reckon, what was it? The reckoning with emotion. Reckoning, yeah, that's right, reckoning with emotion. Yeah, we just start with the basic premise. If you love somebody, anybody in your life, you're gonna get your heart broken. If you're engaged enough in your work, in your life, you're gonna get disappointed. And if you're creative enough and innovative enough, you're gonna fail. So we start from the premise that you're gonna fall. The question is getting back up. First thing, reckon with emotion. I'm snagged, something's going on. And what are you, look, can I ask them questions? Yeah, please okay. do. So how do you know when you've been snagged by emotion? Think about it. A look, or someone gives you a look, or you read a comment, or someone says something, or how do you know you're in emotion? Nisha, what's, what's your answer to that question? Hey, Nisha, that's my wife, Kate. You guys should know yes, each other. Yes, we, awesome. we said hi. <laughs> um, so I know I'm snagged by emotion. Can you stand up, Nisha? Yeah. yeah. When I'm unable to see any other perspective or there's like an emotion that's crashing around, oh, sorry, a totally. story that's crashing around the emotion. So it's totally. not like the purity of sensation. It's like all the sensation and, oh my gosh, I'm horrible. Oh my God, they're gonna see me. Ah, he's an asshole. You know, whatever. The story is that's contracted around. So the, the story's emotion. crashing around you and, and I have you've no lost perspective. perspective. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's, that's perfect. That's, that's exactly answer. right. What else? What other, just think about, just get really, what is a response? Yeah. It's yeah, I'll yes, give you a mic. Please. There you go. Um, it's it's a physical experience that is different. It's a it's a, a rapid change to a different physical experience than where I was before that emotion. Okay. So you got heart beating and yeah. heart racing. Sweat. Yeah, yeah. Yes. sweat. Okay. Or or happy. I mean, it can be. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be that that gut clench I mean, of fear. Yeah, emotions are both right. Sides it can of the coin it can be. Uh, just like the world looks shinier, I feel lighter inside, just as much as it can be, I feel tighter. So there's a physical shift. Yeah. Okay, so I think what you're describing and what you're describing points to everything we know in the data, which is there is a physiological response to emotion. So what you're describing, some people will break down and say, I get tunnel vision, I can see only what's happening in front of me, I have no, you know. So we have a physiological response. So men and women who have the best capacity for rising strong, know the physiology of emotion. So they get tunnel vision, something shifts in them. Um, you end up in the pantry and you don't know how you got there, but you're forging for carbohydrates, you know? <laughs> you, right, you wanna punch a wall. Um, you, your heart's racing, your ears are burning, my armpits tingle. Um, there's a, physiolog a, phys a physiological response to emotion. So then all you need to do is get curious about it. You don't have to be like, oh, okay, shame is washing over me. I smell, I feel small and terrible. You just say, okay, man, something's going on. What is it? That's the whole first step. If you can intervene there, you can change the course of your story. The second part is that first story we make up, we have to rumble with that first story. So with the HubSpot example, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. I'm not smart enough. I don't even understand this, what, what, you know, I, I, I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. If you, so here's, let's go back to this example. Okay. okay. You and I walk out, I say thanks for the interview, and you go, ugh, 
and immediately I make up a story. God, I screwed up that interview. I must have said something bad. Something must have happened. Um, so let me tell you how that ends. The story I make up is that I'm not, I did something bad, Chase is mad at me. Maybe I don't even like Chase. Well, yeah, we're not friends, that, it's over. That's okay, that's all right. Okay, we're done. 70% of the men and women who rise the strongest, well, all of them recognize that first story, 70% of them write it down. Wow. They write down the story, why? Why would you write down the story? I have a thing on my phone called SFD. I call these stories the shitty first draft. <laughs> yeah, because Anne Lamont has this great book about writing, um, Bird by Bird, and she said all good writers start with a shitty first draft. Don't all good photographers start with some sure kind you of... you take a picture and you look at the back of your camera? Yeah, yeah I, right, absolutely. Right. So that first story that we make up is super important. It tells us everything that we don't know and everything we're afraid of. So if you own that story and you put a handle on it by writing it down and look at it, then you can ask the three biggest questions of Rising Strong. What story are you making up? What's true? And what do you really need to know more about? So how I would handle this today, I think five years ago, I would have gone off and said, you don't like me. I did something wrong. I'm not enough. Um, and it could have even turned into a really big shit show because then I could have started talking to people we both know, yeah. saying, right, mm -hmm. do you think he's a jerk? Like, I, you know, I mean, do you know, y'all know how that goes, right? In a split second? And before I know it, Oprah thinks I'm a jerk. No, right. not, <laughs> not possible, not possible. But what I would do now is I would probably sit in my car or I would sit in the dressing room and I would be like, what story am I telling? What is going on? I'd text it myself or write it down and then I would circle back with you and say, hey, do you have a sack? So let's just role play it. Do you have a second? Yeah, sure. Oh. Hey, um, when we were walking out of the interview yesterday, I said thanks and everything, and you kind of shrugged your so shoulders and like rolled your eyes at me, and I'm making up that you're pissed off about something. Is there anything we need to clean up? Oh my gosh, just that I, you thought I was mad at you for even a second. I'm not mad at all. I just remembered that I left my phone in my car. <laughs> like, we did not practice that but he knows that's the answer because that's the answer 90% of the time. Like, I almost fired somebody. I was so frustrated with this person because like two or three meetings in a row, we'd walk out and they'd be like, <sighs> and I was like, man, if you're, you know, like, right, like if this is not working for you, we can arrange something else, <laughs> like, you know. And then finally I just said, hey, I need to talk to you. Um, we've been getting out of meetings for the last two weeks and every time you're like, huffing and puffing and rolling your eyes and I'm making up that you're unhappy, something's going on, you're feeling like, she goes, oh my God, I started Zumba a couple weeks ago and when I sit down now for more than 30 seconds, <laughs> I'm not even kidding you, it's like my hip locks from Zumba. And I'm like, <laughs> immediately I'm transported to you like, I love Zumba, where do you take Zumba? <laughs> but in that minute, how many of you would have more respect for someone who said, hey, something weird happened yesterday and I'm making up that there's something going on. Um, can we clean it up? Is there something I need? How many would you respect oh, man. a awesome. person? Mm -hmm. and it's awesome. I mean, yep. here's a great story. I'm in a meeting with my leadership team and it's like a three hour huge meeting and we're under a lot of stress. We're growing something big and new. It's hard. And I look down, there's three agenda items left and we have like 15 minutes or something and we're already in hour three. People are just like, oh. So I'm like, let's just take all this stuff off except for this one thing that's tactical and in the weeds and we gotta get this stuff answered today, so let's just do it. So we start talking and then like five minutes later, my CFO looks at me and says, I'm sorry, I gotta interrupt. And I was like, what's up? And he said, I'm really frustrated. The story I'm making up right now is you took this off the agenda because it's not important anymore, which is fine, except for the fact that I'm spending 90% of my time and resources, as is my team on this issue right here. So if it's not important anymore, I'd like to know about it. And I'm like, man, thank you for having the balls to do that. Yeah, that's big Because time. do you really want someone on your team sitting there in resentment and not listening? I said, no, I'm pulling it out because it's the most important thing on the agenda and I will not cram it into 20 minutes. We will have another meeting where we spend an hour dedicated to just this a week. And he's like, thanks. Awesome. But I mean, how many times do we just sit with these stories we make up? Why aren't we given these tools early in life? Mm -hmm. like, that's the part that kills me is that I'm, you know, too old to be not knowing these things. 
and yet I find, and I think one of the reasons your work is so spectacularly popular is because we don't have these tools. Imagine a world in where we're given these tools as young people, and you know, again, talking to the creative community that's largely listening here, imagine the work that would be possible, and the work that's made, that's shut down because of these feelings that we wrestle with, we don't have the toolkit. That's true. And I, gosh. And I will tell you that, I, you know, I write this in the book, there is nothing more profoundly dangerous than the stories we make up about our creativity. There are no, you know, our creativity, our, our lovability, and our divinity are the three most dangerous stories we make up. Um, and we have to reclaim those narratives. We have to say, just because someone didn't understand or put value on something I created doesn't change its worth or my worth. So no one is ordained to take our story of faith, our story of spirituality, and say it's real or not real based on who we are or who we love or what we believe in. You know, and then the biggest one is really our lovability. Just because someone doesn't have the capacity or the ability to love us doesn't change our lovability. It doesn't make us unlovable because someone couldn't love us. And one of the first stories we lean into when we have someone in our life who couldn't love us is there's something about me that's unlovable. And that is a profoundly dangerous narrative. For sure. You know, so these drives stories. Drives addiction, drives It drives pain, everything, yeah. yeah. And so I think for me, it's really all about when you own the story, you get to write the ending. When you say, here's this crazy story I'm making up, and I'm going to own it, and it's super uncomfortable but I am the author of my life. I will decide how the story ends. I'm the decider. I'm the decider. And I think creatives do that every day. I actually credit my profession as being the thing, because you are, or especially a, a very public figure, like, like both of us, you're, yeah. you're out there, and your goal is to put work out into the world and do so very publicly. That is a very learned response to say, I can say that it didn't go like this at first, early on in the internet. No. But to be able to say, like, hmm, is this a story that I need to pay attention to? You know, and I actually find this about not just reading YouTube comments, but the 4 a.m., the 3 a.m. voice when oh you wake God. up to go to the bathroom. Yeah, that's a mean one, right? That's a mean ass Why voice. Why is the bathroom voice so mean? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I just listened to a great podcast between Tim Ferriss and Tara Brock. Tim, oh, yeah. Is, yeah, Tim's a good friend of both of ours, and that the the voice. And if can you just can we shut that thing down because it gets you, it's it gets you when you're not ready for it. It's four in the morning and you're making your way to the bathroom. You're like, did you do that thing? You didn't do that thing, did you? You're supposed to do the thing. You didn't do the thing. You didn't call the person to do the thing. And why do we get hijacked then? Because our guards are down. Because we're vulnerable and we're just waking up to go pee and then we get yeah. You know, I mean, like that's. I mean, that's what happens. But I have to tell you that I have a great hack for that voice. Ooh, I love this. Um, practical advice. Yeah, this is it. practical advice. I thought at first, when I first started researching shame, because it's a shamey gremlin voice that happens, um, I thought at first that you just like, shut up, like go away. But then all of a sudden, now you're awake and you've got all this fight energy and you're like, oh my God, it's four. I think the best thing to do is, I think it's Rumi who said, invite your enemy to tea. But I think what you do is say, you know what, I hear you. I get it, I get how you're trying to protect me, but I'm good, thanks. It's such a, if you've ever raised a toddler. I can't wait to have the conversation tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, just like, if you've ever raised a toddler, you know that if you engage, you know, and you're like, if you engage, they will, they will, because they will do things that you will not do, so they will win, they will throw themselves on the floor, they'll scream, they'll yell, and shame is the same way. But yeah. if you turn toward that voice that says, Oh my God! You forgot the email to this person. Are you were supposed to do this, or what? You know, why didn't you do this? And you say, "Well, I hear you. I got it. Thanks." Or the voice that says, "You can't do this thing tomorrow. You're not good enough." It's so easy to turn toward it and say, "I really get how you're trying to protect me. Appreciate it. I'm going in anyway. Thanks." And then just right back to sleep. Oh, this is such good. <laughs> I love no, it. No, it's really helpful as opposed to getting all fight energy with it. Yes. I'm gonna take a sip of water because we're gonna try and find a person in the audience who's got a question for Brene. Um, throw up, we got, we've got the two people who've already spoke. Anyone else? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Yes, my good man. 
Hi. So uh, if you could give any advice to your 25-year-old self, what would it be as far as um, countering vulnerability and moving forward? Because you guys have both obviously made it. But for someone like me, who's young, and that gremlin voice is like constantly on me, just wondering if you could share any words. I don't know if I can phrase it that how I would say it to my, well, I guess what I would tell my 25 year old self is this. And I, uh, my 25 year old self would have flipped me right off when I said this. <laughs> so let me just tell you, let me just preface it that way. But I think I would have told my 25 year old self, all the pleasing and proving and perfecting that you're doing is getting in the way of what you're supposed to be doing. You will never, I would have just, I would have grabbed myself by the shoulders and shook myself and said, you will never live the, you can never live the life that you want to live and not disappoint other people. You'll need to choose now. That's what I would have told my 25, like you're going to piss some people off. You're going to let down some people if you're yourself. Because not everybody can like everybody, right? Not everyone can like everyone, and you spend the first, you know, your 30s are notoriously difficult for this. Your 30s are like, uh-huh. <laughs> yes, the 30s, are you, yeah. Yeah, the 30s are like, I think I can be me and be authentic and make everyone around me happy. Um, yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. And then you get, this is the gift of midlife. <laughs> I'm too tired for that. The, yeah, the gift of midlife is like, Something's got to go. <laughs> and for the first time in your life, and you're like, it ain't going to be me. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's what I would tell my 25 cent. You're going to, not cruelly or with intention, but the best thing, you have something that only you can bring to the world, whether you're a, a photographer or a writer or a thinker, you've got something that only uniquely you can bring. Um, and if you try to keep everyone around you happy while you're bringing it, you will not bring it. And not utilizing your gifts mm. is dangerous. That is awesome. That's the, I ask people to try and find pictures that only they can take. Like, right. What is a picture that literally only you could take? It feels like, well, anyone take a picture of Grand Canyon? I'm like, yep, so don't take a picture of Grand Canyon. <laughs> like, what is a thing, a story that only you have access to? And whether that's access to a personality, to a whole group of people, and you're shooting portraits of them, whether it's a story that you have lived the life you've lived and now you have this perspective that is unique, tell that story. Because that makes, that's the difference between something that's benign and general and simple and something that is complex and human. And in the particular lies the universal. That's, people, you know. That's so true. I ripped that off from somewhere. I don't remember where. <laughs> I'm going to rip it off. It's now, you know, I'll tell you this. I looked at some of your photos. Um, I have a book, a beautiful oh. book that you, a Seattle book? Yeah, the Seattle 100. Yeah. Um, but even though, like, I see your heart in those pictures of other people. Like, I, I have a unique relationship with those people yes. that allowed me access that I don't think anyone yeah, else Yeah, like, I have, saw yeah. you in them. Thank you. So it doesn't matter if there were a, a thousand people as talented as you, no one could bring that. That's the point. And, and as creatives, like that is a message that we will never hear enough. That you are enough and you have, there, you have some angle and your job, when people talk about finding your vision, your voice, your job is to find that. Like oh that's God, the that's work. It. That's the work that you need to do as a creative. And whether that's creative in hobby, in career, or just life, like your job is to find the thing that you have a unique angle on and embrace that. And that's uh, authentic. That's sort of where authenticity comes it into is, the conversation. Totally. Um, awesome question. I want to keep on trucking. We've got one question here in the front. Tell us who you are and what's the question. I'm Lakiba. Hi. So I have a question about when you're writing that story and then you go to the person and you, you're going to go to them authentically and say what you said. So when that happens for me, I end up in a battle between my authentic voice and saying what you said and the fear that comes over me. Like for some reason I start, well, another story, I guess, I start to think I'm going to hurt them. They're like, going to be mad. Should, this is what I should. Yeah. Do. That I'm even 
telling them the story that I was writing in my head. I think you that's. Know? I think those are real. I think those are real fears. I think okay. those, and I think they're reality. So I think there have been times when I have said to someone, you know, and let me tell you one thing. When I, when you, you know, your shitty first draft is honest. When you can look at it, and you feel like you would die if anyone ever found it. Okay. You know, because those SFDs should be totally unfiltered. They should say, it might not all sound like a really pissed off five year old. They're like, <laughs> it's not fair. I hate this person. Um, you know, it, they're because. It should be unfiltered and honest. Okay. And then you need to ask yourself, what do I need to know more about the situation, about myself? And sometimes I don't even go to that person. Sometimes I realize, you know what? I'm only gonna go to you. Like if I go to you and say, look, I'm in struggle and here's what I'm making up about what's happening between us right now. That is a complete vulnerable investment move. And if I don't have a relationship with you that is of some value to me, I'm, not, I'm gonna work that story out on my own. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and this is huge, I think, part of this, we never share these struggles with people until our healing is not dependent on their reaction. All right. Snap, snap. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. like that's, that's yeah. pretty yeah. serious. Like, right, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, like, let's say it's a hard story between me and someone in my family. Steve. Steve. Um, Steve's a hard one because he and I use this, you know, that Not line, Steve. the Sorry. story, I, well, the story <laughs> I'm making up, he and I use that line in our marriage probably two or three times a week. I use it with my kids. I use it with my, our leadership team uses it. But let's say it's like someone, let's say it's a parent or an in-law. Um, for me, I've already worked through the hurt attached to that. So I want you to know this. And here's what happens let's say let's say you're my mom and I say look this happened yesterday at after church at lunch and the story I make up is that you were embarrassed you thought I was saying something I shouldn't have been saying in front of my sisters and you're squeezing my knee under the table and it really hurt my feelings and so I'm making up that you think I was talking out of turn or something and she comes back and says well you were, were talking out of turn you know and you need to like zip it and you know I don't think my mom my mom would never say that but then it gives me a great opportunity to say, okay, let me hear your concerns. Okay, I got it, I understand. Here's what's okay and here's what's not okay. It's okay for you to talk to me about your concerns. It's not okay to squeeze my leg under the table and don't put me down in front of everybody at the table. Those things are not okay. Boundaries. Boundaries. So what ends up happening, it's totally boundaries. Mm -hmm. Every time I've come back telling someone, here's what I'm making up about what's happening, and they're like, damn straight, I am mad. It's been a boundary issue. Okay. And so you gotta, you gotta be, your rise is never dependent on other people. That's amazing, yeah. that's powerful. And I think about that, I went to the creative, the professional creative where you're putting your work out there all the time and where it might be my job or someone else's job to say, yeah, nah, I don't know what you're thinking here, we need to go a little bit yeah. taller, a little bit more black and white, a little bit whatever. And it's their job to process that and go on and make the next thing. Yeah. And at some sometimes that there, there's a different filter that they're applying to the feedback. Like you can give totally. the same feedback. You have a session every. You know the creative director rolls in, reviews the things, and they do it every day at certain at three o'clock. And then one day at three o'clock, you hear the same thing. You heard something di like the, deck, the day before, the day before that. But today it feels different. And like, to me, that is something that the creative community. We I went back to say earlier we don't have the tools for it. And just literally the simple framework of, it's the professional creative's job is to take feedback and then change their thing. But right. it's also to be able to say on that one day where you're like, I'm making up a little story that we've had feedback three days in a row and that you think I'm a bad designer. And you can say, oh gosh, no, I don't think you're a bad designer. I think you're an awesome designer. I'm being extra hard on you because I want to push you to be the best designer you can possibly be. That is so huge. Yeah, it's but it's real and, and to the, we don't have, I don't think culturally we don't have this, specifically in the creative community I see a lack of it, is the ability to ask that question that you, and the way you phrase it is very powerful. I'm making up a story right now and help me fill in the, the parts that are true and are true. And then it just gives me this sort of open canvas to say what I really feel. And if I really feel that you're doing something wrong, it's an invitation to engage in a discussion about it. That's it. Yeah. Instead of reacting. Yeah. It's, let me give you a very simple, simple, the simple formula for the headline for this whole discussion today. He or she who has the greatest capacity for discomfort 
rises the fastest. I think that might get tweeted a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, maybe he or she who has the greatest capacity for discomfort rises the fastest. And where I learned about discomfort is really from, I don't know who'd put this on, the, on Instagram, but the creative, that whole creative process. Have y'all seen this on, on Instagram and other places? It's like, this is going to be awesome. This sucks. I suck. This is shit. This is awesome. That is the creative <laughs> process, right? I mean, when I write, I'm like, I sit down and write a chapter. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I'm like, then I get like an hour into I'm like, who cares? I don't care. No one reading this is going to care. This, uh, I suck. Yeah. And then, but what happens, because it's your job, it's who you are, yeah. born, you know, born makers, we keep pushing through, and then you get to the place where you're like, this is awesome. Yeah. And you know what? This is the thing about, in storytelling, there's act one, act two, and act three. Act one is the inciting incident. Something happens that's hard. Act two is where the main character tries to solve the problem by every easy way possible without being vulnerable. And so that's that part of the creative process where you're like, I want to do this and I don't want it to hurt. Yeah. It's the dark, you know the darkness, oh right? Oh gosh, yeah, yeah you're right about that. Yeah, it's the darkness. The, day the, two. Day two, it's day <laughs> two. The thing about the darkness that creatives taught me, which is so beautiful to me and has changed my life, is that if it is your 500th meeting with the creative director, and you're in the dark and things are not getting better and you've redesigned and redone this and it's not better, you can't skip day two. You cannot skip act two, even if this is your 20th year doing this. The only thing experience gives you is a little grace that whispers in your ear, you've been in the dark before, you know your way through. So, Stay in the dark. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. And you know, and so when you say, you know, the two of you have some success now. The difference, I think, in probably what you feel when the gremlins are saying, you're not enough, who do you think you are? And the gremlins are saying it to me, and I would I'd venture to say maybe you, oh, yeah. is I know that I will come out of this. That's, that's Yeah, that's, that's a, it. another tool in the toolkit. Right. Of We've referenced the internet several times. We should probably go to the actual internet and get some questions because there's people the from Texas web. and Nairobi. Literally, there were people from Africa, from England, from Ireland, from Switzerland, from I just in, in the questions before the show even started from all over the universe talking about this. So, Nasa, you got a couple of questions from the universe to yeah, ask we us have a lot to ask in. Dr. Brene. <laughs> uh, so I got one from Daniel Wong, and he wants to know. Um, I struggle at at fa the failing test. Um, it's, in my opinion, a fear of failing. Um, what should I do about that? Fear of failing yeah. is pretty natural, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's this yours. This is your show. Take it away. Fear no, of failing. Yeah. I mean, I think the best thing the best thing I can tell him, the best thing I can tell myself, is you're going to fail. Like the only people who don't fail are people who never put anything out into the world. There are a million cheap seats in the arena today. People who will never, ever step foot. They'll never fail. I have cut and pasted that quote and sent it to people, like on the internet, like, oh yeah, mm-hmm, sorry. You're not in the arena. I'm not actually interested in hearing your feedback. Just, I try yeah. not to do that because that's not a... But you're going to fail. Don't, like, don't engage trolls. Don't yeah. engage trolls. But, but it's so... But that's the, yeah. that's the point. Again, if you're just now joining us from anywhere around the world, I'm sitting with Brene Brown, and we're talking about Rising Strong. She's giving us the, uh, the, the very wise advice that if you are actually putting yourself out there, it's not mitigating failure. You will fail. You're going to fail. And you will be face down in the mud, as you say, and you have to actually get back up. So, and yes. you're giving us tools to get back up. So let me give you this tool for failure. There's the two most important seats in the arena. And let me tell you, the arena for me, the hardest arena in my life, not the books, not the TED Talks, not my work. For sure, my marriage, parenting, those are hard. Um, the two most important seats in the arena, self-compassion and empathy. Have one person in your life. You don't need a whole you know, crew. One person in your life who, when you fail, not if you fail, will pick you back up and dust you off and look at you and won't bullshit you, will say, 
that sucked as bad as you thought it did. <laughs> um, hey, you're, you're right. all dirty. Yeah, yeah, like that was, that, that, that spill was as hard to watch as it was to, but you know what, I'm pushing you back in because you're being brave. And so you gotta have one or two people who will rally around um, and then to see expectation, it's gonna happen. Like, I'm gonna, we're gonna fail. So true. Next question, one more from the internet if you got one there. Yeah, NASA. I have, um, it's Tony Sully, and he wants to know, um, when you've been saying mean things to yourself all your life, how do you switch and start saying kind things? Is it a switch that you can flip, or are we, are we taking the not three-step process? Well, you know, it's really, I, if, if you really, if that's your self-talk, which we all have it, right? Everyone has a self-talk sometimes, the gremlins. Um, I think even more than rising strong would be daring greatly or with the gifts of imperfection about really talking about shame and self-talk. For me, I have a big thing in my desk over where I work and write that says, talk to yourself like you'd talk to someone you love. Um, and that is really hard to talk. So the best story I can give you is sent a really horrible email. I thought I forwarded a, I got a really mean email from someone that just was horrible. Like, you suck, you're not wholehearted, because I turned down an event with this person. And, and I was like, I, I, I forwarded to Steve with a little note that was like, this guy's a total, like, I mean, yeah, yeah every <laughs> word you can think of. Like, there were four or five of them hyphenated. Um, and I accidentally hit reply instead of forward. <laughs> the guy's like, oh. yeah. Where's the mic so you can drop it? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I looked up and I was just getting ready to berate myself for doing it. And I saw that sign that said, talk to yourself like you talk to someone you love. And, and what then you went, high five self. Yeah, no, right, right. <laughs> Way to go. No, and I thought, what would I say to my 16-year-old daughter who is emailing for the first time a lot now? And she, she's going to make this mistake, right? And I would say, look, if you email enough, you're going to do this. So let's take a deep breath not dog down on yourself, figure out how to clean it up and make amends. And that's what I did. So I think we have to get clear on shame and understand shame if that's our self-talk. And it's a practice to talk to ourselves in a way that we would talk to people with respect. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take us back in time to the last time you are on the show. And uh, we had a great conversation. You're talking Scared. about, yeah, oh, this is gonna be awesome actually. <laughs> <sighs> oh my. So you're talking about you know, being judged and shame, yeah. and oh, bless your heart. Oh my is God. Is a thing that when people are judging you in the South, say, Texas. Well, yeah, Texas. <laughs> like, uh, would well, you want to give a little color on the bless your heart, and then I'll. I'll oh, no, it. yeah, no. Oh, I remember exactly what I said, because let me tell you, that <laughs> talking about something went wild on Twitter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, no, I was saying that, like, uh, in Texas, it's a very passive aggressive way to judge people is to say, oh, she thinks she looks so cute in that outfit, bless her heart. Um, <laughs> and it's like a way of saying like, I'm judging you and God is on my side. Like, <laughs> even God is against you. And so I made the comment on this show that I will never be able to live down, that one day I'm gonna get a t-shirt made that said, if you bless my heart, I will punch your face. No, um, I will it, kick your ass. I will kick your ass. Is that what it was? <laughs> yes. And even when I was tweeting yesterday about coming, people like were kept tweeting, only if you wear the bless your heart T-shirt on there. Yeah. Well, I will say that an artist who works here at Creative Live oh, named God. Marcos, <laughs> when he heard that statement, whatever a year and a half ago, he designed this actual thing, which does say. If you bless my heart, I'm gonna kick your ass. Oh my God. And so we're having t-shirts made. <laughs> and we'll send them to you when that you get off the book awesome. time. There you go. So shout out to Marcos. Thank you Marcus. very much, man. Yeah. Um, oh my God. <laughs> that, I don't know what happened. I don't know, did you guys get a shot of that one? Is that's that a good great. one? That's great. That's pretty good right but anyway, there. Because let me tell you something. What is the, this is great. Going back to that question that just came on in from the internet. What is the opposite of shame? What is the antidote to shame? is empathy, question. empathy. So if you call me and you say, God, Brene, you're not gonna believe what's happened at work, I'm in such a shame spiral. And I listen to you and I respond empathically like, oh, dude, I know what that feels like. Like you're completely alone in this and there's no way out. And you're like, yes, shame can't hold on. But there's a huge difference between empathy and sympathy. 
Empathy is feeling with someone, like, oh, dude, I get it. I've been there. You're not alone. Sympathy is, oh, you poor thing. I'm so sorry. That must suck to be you. I'm really, yeah. And I think that bless your heart thing is a really sympathetic, like, sympathy. I feel bad for you. While I'm happy, I'm not you. Do you know what I mean? It's weird that sympathy, like culturally and contextually, is like, oh, I have so much sympathy for that person, which is like, oh, it sucks to be you, oof. Yeah. Which is, that's not, like, you need to sit with someone in the dark and just hold on to their hand and that's I'm it. with you. I'm with you. Yeah. The two most powerful words when someone's in shame or in pain, me too. Like, I get it, you're not alone. Shame hates it. They can't hold on. Well, thank you for that. We'll, we'll oh my figure God. out what kind of t-shirts are the right ones to make so that you'll actually wear them because I just, I can't wait to see you in that t-shirt. It's going to be oh, awesome. I'll totally wear that t-shirt. So we're going to go back to the internet for one more question, then we're going to go to the in-studio audience, but we've got about 15 minutes left. So please, Nasa, one more question from the World Wide Web. All right. So Kieran Liggins, what's up, Chase and Renee? Tips on idea expansion and getting the best out of idea sessions. The best idea sessions. Boy, that has something to do, like brainstorming. How do you how do you turn mm -hmm. off the criticism voice? Something like that. Well, I immediately go to Ed Catmull, um, oh, yeah. the CEO of Pixar, and his whole idea of a brain trust, um, and how if you can, you know, if you can put together ideas are really fragile things, um, and in order for like Lisa with my team, if we're in an idea session. We really have to set a safe container before that starts. Yeah. Even though there are people we know and we trust, we have to, we usually start with a check-in about what do we need to rumble. It's a word that I use from the Rising Strong process, rumbling with a story. What do you need to rumble today? Meaning what do you need to speak your truth and say what's on your mind? And then we do permission slips. So we use post-it notes and everyone writes themselves permission for the meeting. Um, and then we go around the table and share our permission slip. So like a permission slip for me might be, I give myself permission um, to feel tender today and to listen more than I talk. And Chase might say, I give myself permission to be honest today. Or, you know, and then we just check in with each other because container building is a term that they use a lot in mental health. Um, but what I've learned from working with a lot of leaders and organizations and with my own team is you have to build a container. Yeah. There's a lot um, of assumption that exists, especially in the creative world. Like, oh yeah, we're creatives, we're, we can take it, we're done. let's get to work, people. Yeah, but build it, take, I mean, it's five minutes to yeah. go around the room with eight of us and say, what do you need from us today? And what are you giving yourself permission to do today in this meeting? And then you know where everyone is. Um, and so I say the best ideas can only be born with very trusting midwives. You that's, know? That's powerful. That's the, the, um, the notion of safety. Can you talk about safety and trust? You talked about trust a fair mm -hmm. bit in the book. And you know, we talk here at Creative Live around about trust and accountability on our team. And, or if you're, a, you know, make a sports analogy, you pass the ball right, you're expecting someone gonna be there, you're trusting that that's gonna happen. Um, accountability is like, you either were there or you weren't there and I'm gonna do my best to be there every time. And if I can't, I'm gonna let you know. Uh, Talk about trust in through the lens of Rising Strong. Yeah, so trust was trust really emerged as a huge construct in this in this work. And so I was very interested. I came across this work by Charles Feltman, who talked about he gave this definition of trust that I love. Are you ready for this? Don't attribute it to me if you're on the web. It's Feltman, <laughs> like felt and then man. Um, but his definition of trust is great. It says, I'm choosing to make something important to me, vulnerable to your actions. I'm choosing to take something important to me and make it vulnerable to your actions. That's trust, right? And so he talks a little bit about the importance of understanding what trust is. Because if I looked at you and we worked together and I just said, dude, I don't trust you on this. That's a big word and that's a, you're, yeah. you know, that's a heavy thing. And so I went in asking this question, what is trust? When we, what do we talk about when we talk about trust? And so I went through all the way back 13 years to the data with my team looking for what do people talk about when they talk about trust? And I put together all the concepts and I looked at them and I was able to put them into an acronym that really helps me and it's BRAVING, B-R-A-V-I-N-G, BRAVING. And so what trust is, and you nailed it talking about your team, 
We trust people with whom we have boundaries. There's reliability. You say what you're going to do, you do what you say you're going to do. Accountability, the vault, meaning what I share with you, and this is crazy about the vault. This is what people don't get about trust and confidentiality. I trust you if I share something with you and you don't share it with other people, right? That's because we're in the vault. Yep. But let me tell you what else the vault is, and this is where people screw up trust all the time. But if you and I sit down and you're like, oh my God, did you hear what's going on with Kate? You're not betraying me, but the fact that you're betraying someone else to me changes my trust level with you. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we don't ever think about that yeah. because what we do is we actually try to gain trust by but sharing yeah. secrets with each other about other people. That's so messed up. Right, so the vault, meaning you don't share what I share with you and you don't share with me which not, what is, that, is what, that which is not yours to share. I, integrity, which is a huge thing of trust. I, get, I have a very simple definition, in my opinion, for integrity. It is choosing courage over comfort. It is choosing what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy, and practicing your values, not just professing them. So that, to me, is integrity. Um, N is non-judgment. I trust you if we can be in a relationship where we can both fall down, ask for help, and screw up, and not judge each other. And the last is generosity. I trust you if when I make a mistake, you make the most generous assumption about it first and check it out with me. Yeah, do not ascribe to malice that which can be ascribed yes. to ineptitude or... Yes, exactly. You know. The hypothesis of generosity. What's the most generous assumption I can make about this person's words, actions, or behaviors? So if you think about, and the reason why I think it's helpful to break trust down into concepts is then if you wanna sit down and I work for you, and we're really have, you're having some struggles with me, you don't have to sit down and say, Brene, look, we got some trust issues. You can say, Brene, we have some reliability issues that's affecting our trust level. And now I don't have this big gauzy thing that I can't fix. Yeah. There's something very specific I can work on while we can acknowledge the other stuff is going really well. You should be a professional. <laughs> like, I'm going to try I'm it taking, one day. I'm glad we're recording this because I'm going to play that back. Oh, there's so many, um, you've given us so many nuggets. Uh, I heard something, I'm trying to remember where I heard it, uh, and I'm not going to get it right now, so I won't burn the time, but it was like, look at everybody else as if you were their mother. That's, you know, there's something that's really sympathetic, not to know, empathetic, I almost said it. That was that cultural that slip right there. But, but just sympathetic, yeah. Yeah, the, the, when someone cuts you off and you're driving, you can either look at them and have the whole list of adjectives that we want to say to that person, right or you can say, you know, they are, probably, they are probably, you know, late to help someone who's in help or who needs help right now. Or there's, there's something, a, a great story about him, like, oh, there goes Ricky. He's going to help out Sally. Yeah. As opposed to the thing that we normally say. So is and that a good tool or is that a, is that a crutch? Is that fair for me no, to think? No, okay. it is a life changer. Okay. It is the part of the research, chapter six, that I was so pissed off <laughs> writing it. <laughs> no, really, it, it's like, it's part, it's, it's part of the research for me that I find the hardest to do that. Um, I am not, yeah, I think it's really hard. Yeah, I wish we had time we would do the exercise, but we don't. How, much time, how much time does the exercise take? Do it. Should we do it? Of course. I haven't, okay. Come on. All right. Here's what I want you to do. Do you believe in general that people are doing the best they can? Yeah. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Right. Okay. So people are mixed on this. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of someone in your life that you have a lot of judgment around. Like this person just, that you are just Everyone's like, we got it. You already got your person? Yeah. Yeah. You got your person? Yeah. Okay. So here's my question for you. What if I came down from on high, whatever being or thing you believe in, the universe, nature, God, whatever, and I said, that person you're thinking of right now, I looked you right in the eye and said, that person is absolutely doing the very best he or she can do. Tell me what's behind the face you're making right now. Well, total empathy totally shifted my view. 
um, in a quarter feel of a second. very sensitive about it, He's emotional. Feeling tender, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for being brave and sharing that. Yeah. What else? Who else is feeling something? Yeah. and say, well, they're clearly doing the best they can, then I'm shit. Then it comes back and is directly, that all of that animosity, I direct it myself. Okay, if they're doing the best they can, then I'm an asshole. Mm -hmm. That would be my first response too, when I think about it. So one of the things that happened in this research is this question emerged, are people doing the best they can? And of course my answer was, hell no. <laughs> oh my God, hell no, they're not doing the best they can. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. <laughs> right. And so here's the thing. Are people doing the, and I was like, oh, no, no, they're not doing the best they can. And so my therapist really pushed me on this. And so I was like, when I'm pushed in something in therapy, I usually open up a research study on it to disprove, <laughs> to disprove my therapist. So I start asking, interviewing hundreds of people, like we're asking, like, do you believe people are doing the best they can? And so. We, we don't know the answer. There's no, there's, there's no research answer. There's no definitive answer. But my husband was like so brilliant. So I said, do you think people are doing the best they can? And this was after like probably 50 interviews where it was completely saturated. Well, here's what I was learning. The people who said, oh, hell no, were absolutely the people who were hardest on themselves, struggled with perfectionism. Um, and the people who said, yeah, I think in general people are, were much kinder to themselves and much more fell into the wholehearted category. And so my husband's like thinking about it and he's a pediatrician so he sees the worst in people and the best in people. And he, his answer was so profound. He said, I'm not sure whether they are or not, but when I move through the world assuming they are, it makes my life better. And so what I came to the conclusion of, and so I call it living big in the book, because people who assume normally that they're not are people who usually lack boundaries like myself because I'm constantly pissed off, wondering why you're doing all these dumb things. Are you trying to <laughs> aggravate me on purpose? Why don't you make better choices? Why are you putting all us through, you know? But the question becomes this. Think about your person. You got your person in your mind? What boundaries need to be in place for you so you can extend, and so you can stay in your integrity and extend the most generous assumption about this person? What boundaries do you need to put in place to stay in your integrity and be generous towards your, this person. So for me, it would mean if that person's really doing the best they can and I wanna be generous, I need to put some boundaries around my relationship with this person and say, I gotta stop trying to fix you and help you out in return for an unspoken condition that I'm putting on our relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I did this with a group of priests and deacons in the Episcopal Church. And I asked someone, I ha asked this, everyone in the room to think of someone and this couple who were both deacons in West Texas, with very tough rural, um, they both thought of the same person. And when I said, what boundaries need to be in place? And this was, I said, why do you hate this? Why, why does this person bring up so much judgment? And they said, we keep bringing money and diapers and formula. And they're, you know, they have six kids and they live in this trailer with electricity and he sells the diapers and the formula sometimes for money to gamble. And you just, you, they were just like, we can't stay out of judgment with this person. And I said, so what boundaries would need to be in place for you to stay in your integrity and be generous toward this person? And they both just, they were a couple and they just started crying and they said, either bring stuff and leave it with grace or stop helping. But the thing that's not working is we just keep it's going and judging. And yep. judging. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I think that ascription quote. Mm -hmm. Not ascribed to malice, what could be otherwise explained by incompetence or any other. A thousand yeah. things, yeah. right? And so for me, it's always what boundaries need to be in place so I can be in my integrity and be generous toward other people. And it has made me very fierce with my boundaries. I mean, things like, I really care about you, I like you, I love being neighbors, but you can't drink as much as you normally drink when you come over to our Christmas party because it's uncomfortable for me and my family and the kids that are at the party. Like, who, who's, like who's saying that? <laughs> because what I'm better at doing is not saying anything, not setting any boundaries, and then talking bad about you later. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and then you're, you're taking that badness and you're passing it on 
in the trust vault to somebody else, yes. and you're eroding that relationship yeah. that you have. It's sort of like a bad set of dominoes. It's a bad yeah. set of dom, and the and it's exhausting. So I think whenever I'm wondering why everyone's trying to piss me off on purpose, <laughs> I go back to the living big, right? Yeah. Uh, we're gonna have one more question from the studio audience. We're gonna go to you right here. You've you've uh, been visibly and vocally excited about a lot of stuff throughout the show, which has been really fun. So. Um, First, thank you. I'm a super fan. Um, saw you at UCLA on Saturday. Um, Traveling the we'll be at the book like thing days. tonight. Oh, um, good. Um, with my wife, who's not here, who's watching. So she probably wants me to say something. So this is my question from a friend who's also watching. Yes. Um, what happens when people we love and value most don't know how to adapt uh, when we start living more wholeheartedly? And she said to say, asking for a friend. And that's Victoria. She knows who she is. Outed. Um, Outed Victoria, yeah. asking for a friend. Yeah, let me tell you something. The wholeheartedness thing about living, you know, living and loving with your whole heart and being authentic and showing up and being seen and being vulnerable, you're gonna shake loose some people in your life that I think first of all, I, I never know how to say this without sounding like it's like it's wrong. So maybe you can fix it for me. <laughs> yeah, like okay, yeah, no, try try to understand what I'm saying here. I haven't come up here with it yet. Kay. Exactly. Okay, let's do this. I don't want to say that we're accountable for helping making other people understand our changes. But what I'm, I guess what I'm trying, because that sounds like enmeshment and some yeah, yeah. bad stuff, right? But I don't what even I, know what you just said, but yeah. Yeah, so. but what I'm trying to say is if we're really good friends or you're my partner or you're my brother and I'm really changing and trying to work on the way I live, you got to understand that's going to be scary for the people who care about you. Yeah. And to say to them, at least, you're not accountable for bringing them along, but if you're invested in a relationship, to look at that person and say, here's what I'm trying to change and why, and here's this crazy TED talk or this interview with Chase and this person, or here's what's speaking to me right now and what I'm trying to do in my life, and I want to share what I'm thinking with you because our relationship and you matter to me. So you're not accountable or responsible for changing people along with you because that's a no, that's a non-starter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you are, it's like when I was getting my master's degree in social work and I was taking women's theory and feminist practice and all these things, and I would come home and Steve would say, hey, do you wanna go to the movies, babe? I'm like, don't call me babe. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, just don't call me babe, it's super oppressive and I don't, I don't appreciate you. And you know what? In fact, in general, Poor I Steve, think your Steve's behavior you know, like, and, and he's like, he would almost be in tears, and he's like, what's happening? Because I didn't, because I didn't say, man, I'm in these classes, and I've come to this, like, new understanding about gender and internalized oppression and how I value, you know. I just punished him for not knowing and changing with me. But I think the thing is that when we really feel comfortable with our growth, we can understand how that can really freak people out sometimes. Does sure. that make sense? That is... Yeah, it's beautiful. And I feel like that's what you have done so well. If you haven't actually answered everyone's questions, which I think you've done an amazing job about all the stuff about vulnerability, trust, shame, you've opened the conversation in a way that our culture hadn't had it open before. Thank you. Like, I hope so. no other. I want to. Like, it, that is, it's so powerful. That's powerful medicine. Um, I already have like three copies of your book, one on my iPad, one on Kate's, and a physical one. Um, if you're, you know, if you're at home and you don't have this book yet, please pick it up. I don't want to just, you, your, your book has sold itself. It's already at number one, so there's no way for it to go. But uh, I, it, from a, a Make it a number. From a cultural standpoint, you've really changed the dialogue. You've moved it in a direction that, you know, it was hidden under the cloak of fear. And I, I grew up, my entire childhood was is around something like it was just, I felt in it's hindsight. I had a great middle class upbringing. Like I have nothing to complain about. But when I, I think of all the stories that I told myself and the actions that I took, like it all, it was so much of it that was bathed in fear and um, darkness and not a conversation about the conversation that you've started around all these things. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, and thanks, you know, I do, I, I, I'm excited about this conversation. I really want to be a part of it, but I don't want a conversation as something between people. And so without people like you giving me a place to come and talk about it, 
Um, oh, we are happy to provide that. But really, I mean, so I'm grateful for that because that's hard when you have something you really believe in and you're passionate about it. Um, but you can't do that without people, a conversations between people. So thank you. It's, it's, well, you're welcome, but it's very, very easy to give someone a gift who you feel like has given you so much. And not me, me personally, for sure, but so many people, again, we've mentioned it several times throughout the show, I feel a, akin to the creative spirits that, that participate in Creative Live and have paid attention to my work and the work of my peers. And I know that there's so much goodness that's absent because of some of the problems that you are uncovering and bringing out into the open. And we owe you a huge set of gratitude. Uh, I gotta wrap the show up right now. I wanna say thanks. There's probably a couple people that we should give some signed copies of Brene's book. You wanna give me a couple of to read off here? Maybe you can read them or Kate can hand them to you. What do you got? I wanna say that these folks are getting signed copies of Brene's book. And that would be, thank you, Nasa. That's Jenny Barber, at Jenny Barbs. Alyssa Hippolito, at Then and Snow. Uh, Anthony Williams, at The ACW Show. Kevin Kwok, uh, K Kwok. Beatrice Clay, at Beatrice underscore Clay. Laura Dow, at Laura Dow. Lauren Nicole, at Ocean Eyed. And Gilbert Ho, at Gilbert Ho. Email production at chasejarvis.com. Send us your email address, and we will send you not just a book, but a signed one from her. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big, big, big round of applause for Janae. Woo, woo. Signing off. We'll be back next time. Stay with us. We love you. Goodbye, Internet. Mwah. You guys, it's so fun.